Hello everyone and welcome to Indian Radiologist once again. This week's video is a very unusual one, one on barium enema. And why I say unusual is because this study happens to be a thing from the past. And uh, we're just putting this video across to let you know as what we used to do about 10, 20, 30 years ago and how irrelevant it has actually become. There are some centers still that would be doing this test. But uh, in most centers, we have moved on to other modalities like ultrasound, CT and MR to give us the diagnosis that we need. Another reason for barium enemas to disappear is of course colonoscopies, which are much more sensitive and much more accurate compared to barium enemas. So still we are going to have a look at what we can see on barium enema studies. Thank you. So before we start talking about how to do this test, we must know about the contraindications of this procedure. Hence, it's always useful and very important to take a standing x-ray of the abdomen before you start this procedure. Why? Because you will rule out an acute perforation by seeing that there is no gas under the diaphragm. You should also not do this procedure when there is an acute fulminating colitis, when there's been a recent rectal biopsy. And also, if there is dilated bowel loop seen, like large bowel dilatation, and you're suspecting toxic megacolon, that's a very good reason not to do this test, no matter how much the clinician forces you. So here we can see two images. One is on the left that shows us a complete uh, small bowel obstruction, which came with abdominal distension and was actually referred to us for a barium enema. Obviously, it was declined, and the patient went for CT. And the image here on the right side where we can see a very enlarged, dilated transverse colon. Cutoff uh, measures vary, but usually anything more than 6 centimeters means that you cannot do this test. Do remember, in case uh, there's been a rectal biopsy or a suspected perforation and you do end up doing this test, there's a very high chance of uh, the barium leaking into the peritoneal cavity and mortality rates for barium peritonitis are as high as 50%. So, in the past, we used to use Dulcolax and Dimol, which was absolutely terrible and had very poor bowel cleansing. And we used to really struggle to get the barium up to the terminal ileum and the IC junction. But now, with the use of Peglac, we have very good intestinal cleansing. So, what we do in our institute is we do not use the entire sachet of Peglac. We use half of this. You mix it in about a liter of water and make the patient start drinking this early in the morning around 6.37. Usually, defecation is initiated within about 30 to 45 minutes and the patient might have 5 to 6 loose stools and uh, might get a little exhausted by the time uh, his bowels get empty. So it's not a bad idea also for them uh, to... Just maybe sip uh, some lime juice or a cup of tea with some sugar so that they don't feel too dehydrated. Once they finish and they feel that the large bowel has cleared, they can then come to the department. So the patient will lie down um, in a position to, uh, to do a digital rectal examination and we pass a little tube connected to the barium can. And uh, the can's height for the enema, of course, should not be more than three feet and we slowly release it. At a very slow speed, if you release it too fast, uh, there's a chance that that patient might release the barium on the table and be an absolute mess. So release it slowly into the rectum and uh, initiate a comfortable conversation with the patient so that uh, the patient is distracted and, and the barium continues to enter the large bowel. As you feel on fluoroscopy, on IATV that it has reached the rectum and is moving towards the splenic flexure, you can turn the patient around and put uh, the patient now right side down so that the barium from the splenic flexure can move downwards to the transverse colon up to the hepatic flexure. And once that happens, not a bad idea to make the patient supine and uh, make head high so that uh, the barium then moves towards the cecum. If the IC junction is lax, you might also get barium entering the terminal ileum. Once you see that, 
uh, you can start taking pictures of the single contrast study. So the standard pictures would be on a 1417, you might take a supine, a prone, a rectum lateral to see the presacral space and of course both obliques right and left. As soon as these set of images are taken and viewed, uh, you can ask the patient uh, either to uh, to pass out the barium uh, by removing the tube and sending him to the restroom or else you can actually get the barium can down and see that the barium comes back into the can which will of course later dispose. If you feel more than half or almost half of that barium that you had put inside has come out, uh, that's good enough because we do need some barium inside and now you'll be now you'll be passing air through a BP cuff instrument which is attached to the to the tube that is passed again into the anal canal and you start insufflating air keeping the patient calm not going too fast but just at a, enough speed to get good distension you will take one check film once of the rectum or the descending colon to see that there is enough air seen and the entire colon should get distended right from the rectum to the cecum this is almost the end of the procedure so now the patient should be told to keep the air in not to release the air and quickly again start taking pictures see the colon on iitv look for narrowing strictures polyps diverticuli concentrate on that areas use compression images also to get a complete study after having viewed the entire set of images you can ask the patient to now uh, pass out uh, uh, whatever barium is uh, was there inside and take a post evacuation film that ends the barium study we will now look at the common pathologies that we see on this examination so here's our first case we can see a single contrast on the left side and you can see that the entire colon has uh, been uh, uh, nicely filled up with the barium however if you look carefully and we zoom this image on the right side along the sigmoid colon you can or see an almost out pouching. This was in fact an old diverticular perforation and a barium enema was asked for in this patient. And not only is that perforation important, but you want to see the sigmoid colon. Sometimes on CT, it might be a little difficult to know whether it's just inflammatory changes because of diverticulitis or whether it's a tumor. So you will sometimes need a barium enema here. And if you can see the images taken in an oblique position, you can actually have a look at the mucosal irregularity you're seeing along the sigmoid colon as well as tiny diverticuli but this irregularity is important because this tells us that we're dealing with a neoplastic lesion and here is our next case again a double contrast study with the large bowel completely opacified uh, with the barium and the air that's the double contrast and what we can see is a short segment stricture seen in the mid transverse colon you can almost see an apple coring like effect with shouldering on either side and this happened to be again a neoplastic lesion. Iliocecal cox was seen so commonly in the 80s and 90s and the early 2000s but uh, we don't see it so commonly anymore and of course there are a couple of varieties you would see the ulcerative type as well as the hypertrophic type but this is the common picture that we see. We see terminal ileal stricture with the disease process involving the IC junction as we're seeing an enlarged cecum which has been pulled up because of fibrosis and you see terminal ileal dilatation just proximal to this stricture. This is IC cox and uh, of course CT will show you concentric wall thickening usually with involvement of the IC junction but we will need histopad diagnosis almost always and uh, more commonly abdominal cox is seen uh, much better on ultrasound and CT in the form of uh, abdominal nodes as well as omental thickening which can also be biopsy to give us a tissue diagnosis and here is our next case this is of course a single contrast study as you can see and you can see a very subtle mucosal irregularity across the entire colon you can also observe the loss of hostile folds please understand that hostile folds may be absent in the descending colon but if you see absent hostile folds in the transverse colon as well as the ascending colon you do know that this is a disease process. This is a classic case of ulcerative colitis. You see this magnified view on the next image and you can see a classic mucosal irregularity. We of course uh, follow up ulcerative colitis not so much on barium enema but more with colonoscopy. Now we have another very uncommon disease which is usually tough to diagnose on barium enema 
but you can see here a little bizarre pattern areas of uh, stricture formation areas of ulceration loss of hostel fold sometimes skip lesions so this is uh, crohn's disease and you can differentiate it from ulcerative colitis more often than not but ultrasound as well as ct scan especially when you are trying to diagnose uh, fistula is uh, much much more effective and sensitive rather than barium enemas and here's another beautiful case and you can see a filling defect which is seen on uh, the single contrast study with a pedunculated lesion seen on double contrast study and this is a classic example of uh, a pedunculated polyp uh, you can catch these very easily on barium enema but uh, of course ct colonography as well as regular colonoscopy is much much superior compared to barium enema and we come to our last case once again you can see a single contrast study in a uh, loblique position again you can see a short segment irregular lesion which is uh, actually a stricture which has formed because of a neoplastic growth in the wall of uh, the sigmoid colon so these are the common conditions that you can see on barium enema you can catch uh, neoplasms we can catch strictures you can see ileocecal cocks and and although you can catch these uh, conditions uh, quite accurately in today's imaging scenario they are just much much more better investigative tools available for us to diagnose without having the cumbersome barium enema procedure to be done so you have ultrasound you have ct and of course also mri but these modalities with uh, the newer sequences and dynamic uh, imaging have actually pushed barium enema to the background and hence barium enemas are now only used in certain conditions in certain institutes and it is not an everyday procedure that used to be done almost 20 30 years ago